Hello and welcome to Conversations in Clean Tech, the podcast that celebrates the clean tech industry and the people that power it, brought to you by Brightsmith. I'm your host, Jenny Gladman, and in this sixth season, we delve deeper into the world of clean tech startups and their founders, from inspiring stories and words of wisdom to the toughest challenges. You can expect to learn about how these pioneering startups and the founders at their helm are propelling us towards a cleaner, greener tomorrow. In addition, they'll be offering you timeless teachings to enlighten, engage, and inspire everyone, everywhere to live their purpose. So today's guest has had a fantastically diverse career. He started out in the 90s as one of the founding 70 members of Citrix, went on to invest in, build and lead several successful organizations. And in 2017, he saw his opportunity to give something back and make his mark on the energy transition. In his own words, he is a man who's busy breaking down methane and producing decarbonized hydrogen to drive the energy transition. And he is the founder and president of Sakowin Green Energy, Gerard Gatt. So Gerard, welcome to Conversations in Clean Tech. Thank you, Jenny. I'm very pleased to, to be with you today and uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion here. Likewise. Um, And before we get deep into the discussion, I always like to hand it to the guests to give a a bit of a background and an intro into who are you? So, uh, like you said, I I started my career in the US back in the 90s, where I joined Citrix, a software company that has been uh, changing quite a bit uh, the way the computer industry is running today. Okay, Uh, At the time, we were looking at going down from the mainframe down to the PCs with a distributed computing. And uh, we invented at that time the concept of cloud computing, what is called today cloud computing. It was a very interesting journey uh, back then where I, I learned how important is a vision and being able to see that far is really important because that what has driven the, the, the team to really focus on a particular objective in order to get to where we needed. Okay. Uh, at the time, we were against every trend you could think in the market, but uh, that has not changed our motivation to really bring to the market something that is, as you can see today, so useful. And so today, when I look at the energy transition, uh, we are in a, in a situation that's a bit similar, I think, where we see a lot of initiatives about reaching the net zero emission, a lot of solutions available, a lot of money being poured into the systems with a result that's very questionable. When we look at the CO2 curve today, we see that all the efforts we are making are not really changing the needle that much. So we've got to think differently. We've got to look at the problem from a different angle. And this is what I learned to do at Citrix. Uh, and that's what I'm doing here today. When I started Sacroen back in 2017, I, in fact, it's a friend of mine from Citrix who invested in a technology at the time that was a particular form of electrolysis that uh, I decided to industrialize here in Europe. And so I launched Sacroen, raised money, got a team together, got people around us. We had, you know, many investors that are, that was following us because the idea was really interesting and the technology particularly uh, attractive. And in the course of the industrialization, I uncovered a technological problem. I mean, I was not alone, but with the team, we uncovered a, a technical problem. And I stopped right away, which allowed me to save some money. And I ended up with a great team around me, a big problem to solve, and some money. And so we went back to a white sheet of paper and think about this energy transition, but without any technologies in mind. So uh, it is a very interesting journey. And, and to go back to, to what I learned at Citrix and, and this journey about uh, following a vision and, and, and putting in place something very important and, and, and getting a team of people to, to really you know, carry with me this project is essential to me. And, and this is how with Citrix, we got uh, the cloud computing to emerge and, and, and get into the market. And, and this is how exactly how I'm managing 
SACO in to, to get a team of people to be really motivated by a subject that makes sense to me and to, to them as well, and contributing to, to this uh, big challenge in a way that uh, we can accelerate the energy transition and hopefully get to net zero emission as soon as we can. It's great and a great story. And I think every founder has their unique reasons for, for doing what they're doing and their unique experiences along the road. But I'm, I'm very interested to hear what inspires you, what makes you tick, what makes you able to kind of keep pushing every day and work so hard towards this. You know, what, what I realize is that uh, within, you know, my generation, the generation before and, and, and again before, I've lived without much consciousness of our planet and where we are. And we have been using natural resources in a way that we have never really counted, you know, what would happen. And we, we had studies, you know, say, well, we are emitting too much. It's going to be a problem one day. And reports after reports, we... we didn't make any decisions, and and we are now in front of the wall. Okay, we are really uh, in a situation that is really bad. And I want to contribute at least with you know the the, the time that uh, I have contribute as much as I can to, to bring a solution. I'm not saying that uh, I'm going to, to resolve this problem, but I mean I want to contribute as best as I can to bring a solution that makes sense that show a way that is pragmatic, quick, and that can allow to change things rapidly. And given that you are a man working on a huge problem, it's it's something that can often feel quite a heavy weight on you. So thinking about the man outside of hydrogen, if that's such a thing, who is the Gerard on a weekend or on an evening? You know, what do you do to, to relax and enjoy yourself and perhaps take your mind off, off the bigger problem for a few hours? Well, I, I am uh, 62 uh, years old and uh, I have five children. I live in a beautiful place in the south of France, in the middle of the forest and not far from the sea. And uh, when I can, I take my bike and ride into the forest. You know, I, I need uh, nature for me is um, my way of uh, reconnecting and and getting back to uh, a balanced state, you know, where I realign myself when I walk in the forest or when I, you know, ride in the forest or you know it's something that is very important to me and uh, i have in the last five years i spent a lot of time on my work for sure because starting a a, a new company you know how, how how difficult it is and starting a new company against the market trends it's even tougher but um i am convinced of where we need to go because it's just obvious i mean it's like to me, it's like the nose in the middle of the face. It's just there, but we don't see it, okay? You know, you just see it when you look in the mirror. It says, ah, this is how I breathe, okay? But uh, it's such an obvious thing. And, and, and you know, the most amazing things is when I speak with people. Last time I was speaking with a, a politician, you know, somebody working at the French government, and he says, you know, why are you the first one to talk to me about the energy transition that way? It makes, it makes so much sense. Why are you the first one doing this? This is too good to be true. And Gerard, from that, I summarize, you're a man who loves his work because I asked you the question, what you do outside of work. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Let's go back to work again. So what I do all outside work is, is really uh, working with my friends and family and uh, and uh, going to mountain uh, skiing and uh, biking and things like this. Uh, no, it's great. I'm I'm just teasing. I think it's it's amazing to see to see your passion for what you do. I think it's one of those things for any founder. You need to have such a deep passion for what you do and such a determination. And it's it's so very very evident in what you do. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I mean there is no difference for me between. Uh, I mean. I like to take weekends and relax. I mean, don't get me wrong. But when I work, it's not a burden for me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a very, very exciting. It's passionate. And, and, and being with uh, the people I work with, you know, I'm just going to meet them and get together and all of that, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's a great thing. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, this work is almost an excuse for me to be with them, you know. <laughs> 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 I love that. And I guess taking one step back and, and thinking outside of Sacco win and, and 
going back to the fundamentals of the bigger problem we've talked about before, the kind of energy transition. And I guess to give a a timeline on that, if we step back seven or eight years to the Paris Agreement, and that I guess the the in some ways lack of progress since that we've made since then, what would you hope for for the industry as an entirety for the next kind of seven or eight years? Well, I think uh, you see, particularly in Europe, okay, there is a confusion about geopolitical issues and natural resources. And that is going to create a big problem. Today, gas, natural gas, fossil gas, okay, or biologic gas, you know, coming from wastes, which is the next energy that we have to use. We, we have to live without waste and being able to do something with our waste that is useful. And, and this is coming. It's going to take time to get there, right? So in the meantime, we have a natural resource that is absolutely outstanding, which is natural gas that can help us do a quick efficient, economical energy transition, which we all need. Look at what's happening today. We are deploying, we're investing money. Governments are putting subsidies. We are giving, we are buying. You know, if your hydrogen is too expensive, the government is going to give you money so you can use your hydrogen and things like this to to make this start. But the problem at the beginning is that the technology is not efficient. So you can do whatever you want at the end, you know, it's just a first step, right? So uh, we're always going to have that issue. So to answer your question, what we need to, to look at is we need to take one step back. I mean, if I look at what's happening in the USA, they have taken an approach that is much, much different from Europe. It is to say, look, what we need is to reduce CO2 emissions, we are going to put a bar here. Below 3.3 kilograms per uh, kilo of hydrogen, you get grant and subvention. Above, you get tax. Okay, And let the market do what it has to do. Okay, And let the companies put whatever technology they have to put t- together to get this problem resolved. Okay, And they are going extremely fast in t- towards solutions. Okay, And we, we see an enormous customer attraction over there that we don't see in Europe yet. In Europe, because we want to be more conservative in terms of expenditures, which I understand, we have chosen to put our money into technologies that we believe could work. But how can you finance disruptive technology knowing ahead of time what it's going to be? I mean, you know, it doesn't work. The goal of this, I mean, we understand we are facing a problem that is difficult. We need disruptive solutions. You know, existing solutions that are we just improving are not enough. Electrolysis is just an old solution. I mean, it's 20 years old and we are just improving it. That's all we are doing. We are not going to resolve the, 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 you know, this challenge that way. So what we need to do is we need to get regulation open, particularly in Europe, so we can finance more technologies more openly, be much more neutral from a technology point of view, so we can let new things emerge. And uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is understand in the regulation that uh, make it as simple, much simpler if we can. And and, in Europe, I'll doubt if we can uh, change the regulation, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of simplification, but at least include the fact that we can avoid burning carbon and CO2, meaning that treating a problem before it occurs, it's always easier than treating it after, uh, after it occurs. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we propose is, is you don't want CO2 emissions, you don't want to combust carbon anymore, remove carbon where it is. You remove it from the gas and you don't burn it anymore. And this way, you know, people tell you in Europe, they say, well, but the problem with gas is that uh, uh, you have all the leaks and all the things on the upstream and all of that. Yeah, you're right. You have that. But if you look at the problem with gas, 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the combustion process. 80%. 20% from the upstream, transport and all of that, okay? The problem is today, changing the combustion is not even thought about in Europe. Gas is always going to be used in combustion. That's the mistake. That's the short uh, siding that we have in, in Europe that we need to change. We've got to look beyond this 
and look at the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is combustion of gas. If you change this, you resolve a large amount of problem in the energy transition quickly. And the US have understood that already and they are moving fast. So it will come, but with a delay again. So that's what needs to change, you know, when, when the regulators are going to understand this and take that in consideration in the writings that they are doing, things are going to go much faster. I agree. And I guess one one thing I'd like to pick out of that last answer that you talked about is disruption. And I think we've both been around long enough to know that for disruption, you need brilliant people and creative people. So I guess my very last question to you is for people out there listening to this who might be considering a career in clean tech, in hydrogen, and not necessarily specific to exactly what you do, but something that's disruptive, what types of people do you think that we need to be solving the energy transition and taking those leaps forward? Well, you see, the value of a startup like us is not money, is neurons, brains. Thinking about a problem differently. We need to have people that are motivated, that have, you know, skills, knowledge, building an efficient energy systems. What we are doing is a, so I'm going to go a little bit technical here just to, to bear with me a minute, but I mean, just to, to understand the challenge here. Methane has been broken for decades already using heat. That's not energy efficient. Use carbon and hydrogen, obviously, but you use a lot of energy to do this. What we are doing is breaking methane with a non-thermal plasma, heat not being the primary source of, uh, of dissociation, let's put it this way. So we are creating a very complex reaction with a microwave plasma, which is an electromagnetic field, okay, that creates a, a, a very complex area where if you understand this complexity, you can orientate your reaction towards hydrogen very efficiently and produce a solution that has efficiencies that are far beyond what we've done so far. So we need people that are willing to tackle hard problems like this because it has not been done before. And, uh, uh, you know, from the scientific point of view, we, we need people that are specialists in plasma, in modeling, simulation, things like this, to build new models that don't, do not exist today because what we are doing is an area of the science that has not been studied yet. You know, breaking methane has been studied for decades already today to produce carbon. And you have a lot of things around this, okay? But it's using heat. So uh, we are doing a reaction that is very different from that. And so we are exploring areas that are, you know, unknown yet. And so uh, it requires people that are, you know, enthusiastic, you know, with knowledge but very tenacious because it's hard. It's hard, but uh, this is where it's going to, to make the difference. And the team we have, I can tell you, they are very tenacious. <laughs> so if, if you're listening and you're enthusiastic and you're tenacious and you feel like this is a problem you'd want to be a part of, then uh, they should reach out to you and, and have a absolutely. conversation. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. Excellent. Well, Gerard, that, that brings us to a close on today's conversation, but that was uh, extremely insightful and, and it's amazing to see that you've been on such a, a journey and you've got so much so much to offer. And I think the, um, the goal of leaving a better world for the next generation and making sure that we're making these strides forward sounds like it's continuing to motivate you. So thank you for your hard work and thank you for sharing your story with me and the listeners today. And yeah, excited to see what comes next. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And um, again, we, we, we are currently hiring, you know, five people. So yes, if you are, you know, with uh, bright minds and willing to tackle the, the difficult problem uh, that makes sense, come and see us. We have a very interesting team, I think, uh, of uh, young people, you know, young and, and uh, mature and uh, senior people as well. We have a mix that's very really interesting of uh, men and women and, uh, you know, quite d diverse. Yeah, and I'm sure that as the world of hydrogen gets smaller from a, a geographic perspective, that will also continue to grow. So, yeah, exciting things ahead. Thank you very much, Jenny. It was a Thank pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise.